Our next speaker has had a long interest in colonial numismatics and has recently been specializing in the, the topic of the problem of dating the St. Patrick's coinage. He's William Nipper, uh, a medium and communications industry strategist and um, a systems manager with the, the Axion Corporation. It's our pleasure to welcome him here today, someone with a true understanding of technical data. <laughs> Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's a, it's a real honor, and um, uh, I do feel a little unusual in that I'm the only one here who speaks without an accent. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, we've heard uh, quotations from Polonius, who I guess wasn't a real guy, but uh, Polonius and uh, Fermi. Uh, this morning. Well, I'd like to quote from uh, Willy Wonka, who's one of my intellectual heroes, <laughs> who said, you should never ever doubt what nobody is sure about. <laughs> and that, that's where I kind of take my inspiration. I was asked to talk about uh, early dating theories uh, for the St. Patrick Coppers, which is a little bit of a stretch for me because I don't believe that they were minted early. <laughs> And so I took a little bit of license, and what, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the theories that were expressed early, <laughs> and then also to share with you uh, sort of a dark horse candidate, if you will, for um, a, a new theory uh, of, of a person who might or might not have been involved. It's, it's uh, whether or not you believe the circumstantial evidence, um, the guy I'm going to introduce to you is pretty interesting anyway, and I think deserving of some additional work. Um, if we look at the different theories around when the, the St. Patrick's pieces were printed, and, or excuse me, minted, um, and I'm gonna be saying farthing and halfpence out of habit, not because I think they actually were farthing and halfpence, but um, one, one of the earliest writers about this was of course John Evelyn, and he thought in 1697 that the silver pieces were metal, uh, metals, and he grouped them of course with the metals of Charles II, and I think you'll see here that from this chart that John Sharp pretty much agreed with that. Um, 1745, um, when uh, uh, Walter Harris was editing the works of James Ware, uh, he was probably the first one to note the arms of Dublin on, the, on what we call the halfpence, what some people call the halfpence. And he also noted that the silver pieces were milled and that copper pieces were never milled. And because of that, they were probably all metal metals. That was his, his assumption. Of course, um, also in the, in the uh, Charles II camp was Ralph Thorsby, who in 1715 recognized uh, the coins as halfpence and farthings. Uh, Michael Dolly was also in this uh, later dating camp. Uh, he said that uh, they basically corresponded with Dublin tokens that were made heavier, uh, the trend toward heavier tokens toward the, the end of the period there. Uh, that they were more consistent with that, that era. Of course, we know about the circulation of the, of the coins into um, the 1670s with the, the finding of a specimen on the Yacht Mary, the ruins of the, the Yacht Mary, and with the demonetization in, in the Isle of Man. All of this kind of points more or less to, to uh, uh, later circulation. Of course, Crosby um, was, was something of a diplomat. He, he listed a really a litany, along with Achilles Smith and uh, Edward Maris, who they all listed litanies of who, who made the St. Patrick Coppers and who believed they were made at, at certain times. Crosby was very diplomatic and said only that he thought they were made not long before they came to America. So in other words, not long before 1681. But he promised to um, not to disagree. Uh, he said he wouldn't be the first doctor to, to disagree with the, the others who had had quoted. Of course, Crosby also pointed to a use, um, theorized that they might be something other than money, um, which I know we've heard some discussion of that this morning as well, but, um, you know, Crosby had pointed that out, as did, um, and in fact, J. Earl Massey, uh, whose name I don't believe we heard this morning, actually uh, thought they were something other than halfpence and farthings. You know, he was uh, an early one to notice that, although Although uh, Stephen Leake's measurements, his weight measurements, actually pointed to a, um, 
you know, he was, he was one of the first to observe that there was a difference uh, very early on in, in the 1700s. Um, writers, um, Maris pointed to um, Simon's um, believing that uh, the St. Patrick coins were associated with Charles I. And he noted that Simon had, um, had uh, referred to the founding of the Order of St. Patrick uh, which, you know, would have placed them in the, in the time of Charles I, but Smith, Achilles Smith, countered that the Order of St. Patrick wasn't founded until much later, so that wasn't a good, a good argument. Um, Leake, as I, as I mentioned, was, was a Charles I, he was in the Charles I camp. Maris, of course, uh, was in the Charles I camp as well, citing the resemblance, as Oliver noted, to to uh, Charles I, and of course, Breen came along and seconded that with his uh, tying uh, the images to, um, to uh, Nicholas Briot. Now, one of the um, third camp theories, I'll call it, so basically we've got an early dating camp and a late dating camp. Uh, no one has come out, to my knowledge, and said they were made during the Commonwealth era. You know, nobody staked a claim on that. But so far, we've got the early theory and the, and the later theory. Crosby described um, a theory by Dr. Robert Kane in, in his book that uh, these, Kane called these Rini, uh, I can't say it, Rinicini uh, coins, that they were actually brought with uh, the papal nuncio when he came to, uh, to Ireland in, uh, sometime in the early 1640s, early to mid 1640s. And there's a lot of current research along those lines going on now if you've watched the, the C4 discussion groups. Well, all of this, all of this was um, sort of confusing to me, as you might imagine. And um, then in 2002, Dr. Danforth uh, published his paper, which I thought was an absolutely landmark uh, piece of work. Uh, I thought it was pretty remarkable. And um, really for me, being sort of an amateur, that it was case closed. And then some people started, you know, trying to, to find inconsistencies in the paper and so forth. And um, I honestly got a little angry. I wanted to go out and try to find support for Dr. Danforth's theories. And that was sort of the, the beginnings of a, of a personal, a uh, little bit of a personal odyssey to try to, to uh, uh, discover something about the St. Patrick coins. And that, uh, of course, immediately, I'm sorry, here. Uh, that immediately led me to some of the symbolism lines of research that Oliver's already uh, very thoroughly examined. I did have a couple of things here that I wanted to point out that, that maybe haven't been said this morning. Uh, one is that um, the, the image, the William Marshall image from Icon Basilica, um, is actually believed to have been inspired by a painting of St. Catherine at, at prayer that was done uh, by Titian and was in the collection of Charles I, in the personal collection of Charles I. And the, the link that most people draw in, in, in uh, determining this is those, the position of uh, her left hand in the picture, if you look at that, versus the, the left hand in the, in the picture over here. But, and I'm showing these not, not to really discuss the symbolism, but to um, get across the idea that, that as an amateur, my first blush at this was to try to find contemporary symbols to, as, a, as a means of dating these things. And this, this was one of the first things that we jumped into. Also, I have a couple of images here of, um, uh, that I don't think we've seen this morning uh, yet. One is from George Withers. Uh, book of Emblems. It was published around 1635 that shows a kneeling David uh, playing a harp with the glory in the top. The other one is from um, the Antwerp Bible, uh, which was published in about 1516. And you notice the David with the harp, he's on a checkerboard floor, and there's a glory, it looks to be an angel, I don't think it's a crown, up in the corner, if, if you can see that. So the point, my point for showing these is merely that um, uh, I've kind of, I'm sorry, I guess I did that. Sorry. Uh, is that these symbols, and I think this is the same conclusion that Oliver uh, really came to, is that these symbols were, were pretty prevalent uh, during this period. They were in a, in a lot of places. So that, from my perspective, that wasn't a lot of help in, in trying to date these things. 
And of course, um, the one that everyone refers to, the one that's in your program, is uh, the, the Gautier engraving from 1619. Um, at the time, uh, the, this engraving was pretty tough to come by, and I was able to, uh, if you're interested in, in an actual printed version of it, uh, uh, the, uh, this is the uh, book of poetry by Thomas Kinsella. It was published in the early 60s, and this was my first encounter with the, with the actual engraving. Um, it's, it's available while Messingham's original book is, is of course, prohibitively rare. Well. Okay, so after looking at all the symbols, all the contemporary sources, I still didn't know and still don't know when, when the St. Patrick coppers were made. But in the course of research, I, I read a book, a 1954 book by a, a fellow named Thomas Coonan. And the title of the book, um, bear with me just a second, uh, was, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the title of the book is actually um, The Irish Catholic Confederacy and the Puritan Revolution, again from 1954. And uh, Coonan actually attributed the St. Patrick Coppers to the, to the Kilkenny Confederation, the 1640, around 1642. But he gave no evidence as to why he, he assigned them to that date. In the footnotes, he quoted two sources. One was Thomas Cart, the Irish historian from, from the 17th century. And the other one was Richard Bellings. And Bellings, of course, was associated with the visit of the papal nuncio to, to Ireland uh, a little bit later on. Well, the obvious thing to do then was to try to run down those two sources. And I began to try to accumulate some of the CART papers to try to learn more about what was in CART. Uh, and frankly, a search of those papers revealed very little mentioning these coins. And I think part of that may be just because um, they're such small denomination that, that no one really uh, paid much attention to it in the overall scheme of things. There was a lot about much larger economic trends in CART, but for example, the transfer of cattle from England to Ireland or wool or uh, you know, lar larger macroeconomic trends, but not about money, about pocket change. And so you know, the, the next obvious assumption was, well, maybe it's in Bellings. Well, a lot of the current research suggests that uh, if the coins were brought by the, uh, from the Vatican or from some third country, then Bellings would have known about that. And I believe that if Bellings had known about it, then Cart, uh, excuse me, then Coonan would have found it and would have, would have talked about that as well. So both of those kind of, kind of ended up as dead ends. However, in searching the calendar of the CART papers at the Bodleian Library in Oxford, I came across a very curious proposal from a fellow named Sir Edward Ford, and this proposal was submitted in 1664. And I'd like to read it to you, please. This is the image of the, of the original proposal. Some of it's a little bit difficult to read, partly just because of the, the style of the text, but it says, to the King's Most Excellent Majesty, etc. The humble petition of Sir Edward Ford, show with. And I'd like to note that right after the show with uh, is a little piece of punctuation that's three dots, three uh, stops, arranged in the pattern that Walter Breen called uh, Masonic on the St. Patrick Farthings. And to me, this is an indication that this is not really Masonic punctuation, it's just punctuation. Okay, but it says, show with that in the, De <laughs> in the December 1660, your majesty granted Sir Thomas Armstrong a patent here of 21 years for the sole making of farthings in Ireland at the yearly rent of 16 pounds, 13 shillings, four pence. That his farthings being ordinary ones and easily counterfeited and nothing offered for the retaking them, in other words, redeeming them, he could never do any good in it, your majesty's rent lost, and he dead. That your petitioner hath invented a new way of making copper or brass, excuse me, brass or copper tokens of one, two, and three farthings, which prevents counterfeits, wherein my lord lieutenant is satisfied, and yet your petitioner with, with all will take order that his agents who vent 
and it's a little bit difficult to read here, uh, shall retake them. In other words, there's a formal uh, method of, of redeeming them in this. Which will give your people there, referring to Ireland, extraordinary content, very many of them not being able to live without them, and so necessitated to take unlicensed tokens, which every petty tradesman make and yet refuseth to retake, as he pleaseth, to the extreme loss to all the meaner sort. Prayeth, your majesty's gracious letter for the passing to your petitioner a grant in Ireland for his new invented tokens, and though most chargeable, yet for the same rent and same time Sir Thomas had for his common farthings, with such clauses as have been formerly, and he shall pray the, and he shall the question pray, and so on. So I think, you know, a couple of things of, of note about this, about this proposal is, one is they're, they're differentiated from Armstrong's farthings, his common or ordinary farthings, in about three ways. One of those is that they were made using a newly invented process, and we don't know yet what, what Sir Edward Ford's newly invented process was, but they were made with a new process. Um, secondly, the new method somehow prevents counterfeiting. Okay? And thirdly, uh, the process has a formal method of redemption for the tokens, which is not something that the, the unlicensed tradesmen's tokens had. Next, um, another item about this is that, that we, we actually see the mentioning of a three farthing piece in conjunction with a, a, a two farthing piece and a, and a, and a single farthing which might have some relevance to, to Dr. Mossman's presentations of weights. I'm, uh, we need to talk about that. Uh, the other, um, Lord, the Lord Lieutenant who's pleased presumably refers to Orman, which really kind of fits within um, Dr. Danforth's work. And uh, the, the final thing is that Ford's proposal promises to give the Irish people extraordinary content. And I've struggled over whether this might be the thing that's referred to in the, on the legend on the farthings where it says, and my Latin isn't very good, so forgive me, but quies scot plebs, or plebs. Uh, in other words, let the people be at peace. Uh, I wondered if there's not a tie with that. Now, I began, after finding this, I began to look for just who Sir Edward Ford was. And it turns out he was born in 1605 in Harding in West Sussex. And uh, he has kind of an interesting genealogy. His parents, um, his mother was a member of the Carroll family, which was an old Catholic family uh, from, from that region. They remained staunchly Catholic throughout this period. In fact, took the side of the Jacobites later on. His father was a man named Sir William Ford who was a soap projector. And as far as I can tell, that means he sold soap, which might have put him in contact with tallow channelers, say, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Although he died um, when Mark Newby was only eight years old, so I don't think he actually knew uh, uh, Mark Newby. Uh, but the... Um, um, he was admitted to Oxford. Um, Sir Edward Ford was admitted to Oxford uh, early on. Uh, he had a little bit of trouble in school. He wasn't such a great student, but he was a, a very good engineer. And he built numerous um, kinds of water pumps, hydraulic pumps, things for moving water around um, uh, throughout most of his career. And when the English Civil War started, he took the side of Charles I, was a, a very staunch defender. Uh, for Charles I. He was captured, um, he, was, he was put in prison, but when uh, Cromwell came to power later, he rec Cromwell recognized the um, potential that, that Ford had to actually transform uh, technology to bring water to places in London that didn't have uh, good water supplies and so forth, and so he was spared most of the, the imprisonments and the, the heavy punishments that, that uh, supporters of Charles I had taken. He, um, uh, in 1666, well, the, the proposal that you see here was actually submitted in, in 1664. It appears not to have been taken up, but as Pepys noted, uh, uh, 
Sir Edward demonstrated this process, whatever his process was for making these farthings. Ford demonstrated that several times at Whitehall and other places, and in, sometimes in, in uh, the presence of uh, Berkeley and Carteret and some of the other key figures in the, in, in the settlement of, of West Jersey. At one point, uh, Pepys actually mentioned several uh, demonstrations of the process, and he describes um, Ford's process as the best yet seen and so forth. At one point, Pepys uses the phrase, oh God, to see this again. And it's not clear whether he's being sarcastic that he's already seen it many times or if he's actually um, uh, that excited to have seen it again. Now, in, in 1667, January 4th, 1667, uh, another entry, this time from the uh, calendar of state papers domestic for Charles II, um, and I won't read all of it, but it basically um, grants, um, grants uh, Ford uh, the right to make uh, his farthings for Ireland, essentially. And um, this, um, it, it's not clear exactly, uh, and, uh, well, I did want to read one other, one other little piece here. The Oxford uh, Chronicler, uh, Anthony Wood, who lived uh, from 1632 to 1695, wrote of Sir Edward Ford. He said, sometime after His Majesty's restoration, he invented a new way of farthings, of which he made demonstration to the king and council so plainly that they were satisfied that they could not possibly be counterfeited, and that one farthing could not be like another, but that they should differ in some little thing. And having then a design to get a patent for making them for England was put aside for Prince Rupert, by Prince Rupert, and at length was content with only one for Ireland, and to which place he, he took journey soon after. Now what we, can, what we think was that Sir Edward Ford traveled to, to um, Ireland uh, sometime around the, the uh, January of 1670, if not a little bit earlier. He died in Dublin. Uh, in, in September of 1670. So he was only there for a short time. And yet one of the questions that comes up is that, uh, and he was brought back to England, to Harding for interment. One of the questions that comes up is what happened to this technology that he had, that he had devised? You know, he had been demonstrating it now for s six, seven years. And he took it to Ireland for the purpose of setting up a mint. What happened to, that, uh, to, to the work that he had done? And we don't know um, the answer to that. I did do a little bit of research into um, um, Harding, and I'm in communication with some people in Harding right now, uh, Ford's hometown. The three big families that were part of um, uh, part of that city in in the early days were the Fords, the Carrolls, and the Hussies. Um, no, uh, unfortunately, no link to the Ford arms there. Uh, the Carols have a martlet or bird, which you might uh, construe as being similar to the one on, on the St. Patrick's Farthings, but I don't, I don't really think there's a link. Um, I included this one of the Hussies because this ermine um, symbol is um, identical to one that, that, that appears on the St. Patrick's Farthings. And again, I don't know if there's any link at all between the, the Hussie family and, and Ford. Um, these are some pictures. This is the... Um, church in Harding. It was, it was actually built in the 14th century and it was uh, uh, the Carrolls and the Fords were very instrumental in, in paying for that church. Uh, they, they were very uh, key figures. Um, it was then at, in the early days it was St. Patrick's um, and sorry St. Mary's Catholic Church and then it became St. Mary and St. Gabriel's now as, as an Episcopal Church. But it, like, it looks like many village churches so I don't think there's anything uh, particularly significant uh, about that. This is the home that um, Sir Edward Ford's um, Up Park home eventually became in, in Harding. And the reason I'm showing that is to show that he, w he was a man of means and he was a, uh, you know, a mover and shaker from that period. And I think he could have, he could have very well have, have been well connected uh, you know, to, to people who might have let him make coins. I got very excited when I saw this image on, on the left here. Uh, this is from a stone engraving uh, from the church in Harding. And um, 
as you can see, there's some pretty obvious similarities uh, to the St. Patrick's. And then I discovered through reading that this was a World War II memorial. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it doesn't really have the relevance. relevance. And yet um, th there's a fellow named David Olaf in Harding who is uh, actually searching, interviewing local historians right now to find out what the inspiration for this, for this particular engraving was. And they're also going to run a, a, an adver, uh, not an advertisement, an article in the local paper asking for information, uh, if, if anyone has any information about that. So it's really uh, been, been a little personal odyssey. In conclusion, um, I think with, with uh, Dr. Danforth's works and uh, John Griffey's work and uh, Dr. Mossman and, and various ones, uh, uh, Stan Stevens, I think we're probably closer to solving this dating mystery than we've ever been. Uh, but obviously there's still answers to be found. And secondly, um, I, there's, there's not an, enough evidence to suggest that Sir Edward Ford was even linked to the St. Patrick coffers, and yet he's interesting enough that he deserves further research, and I intend to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for William? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> everybody's been asking me that. Um, uh, the question is, uh, how did I originally get on to Sir Edward Ford from, from uh, the other materials that were out there? It was actually um, trying to find references to the St. Patrick Coppers in the cart papers and the cart catalog that's in the Bodleian Library at, at Oxford. There was a reference in 1664 to that proposal. I then contacted the library and purchased a photocopy of that, of that proposal should say that I've also purchased a number of other documents, none of which have been fruitful, not all related to Sir Edward Ford, but uh, none of, not all of which have been fruitful in, um, you know, furthering the search. I'll be happy to share that. Okay. Right. Thank you.